I've had the opportunity to pastor the same church for over 30 years. And I only say that because that means I've met a lot of believers that have come through here, and they're not all here. And some for good reasons and some for not good reasons. But when I think of those people, if they, even if they left for what I would think, in my opinion, are the wrong reasons, I still think about them usually in a very fond way. And I usually think of them with concern and care, hoping that they are still really enjoying God's work that they are still really focusing on who God is and what he's doing and appreciating that. The Apostle Paul is going to express the same thing, and he had spent a very short time with the Thessalonians, and yet nonetheless, he really cared about these people, and he was really concerned about them. And we're going to take a look at some more things that he has to say as we continue looking here through 1 Thessalonians in our current study on getting along. I'm Pastor Tim Holsher, and as we're thinking about getting along, we're just doing a survey right now through the New Testament, considering different statements that we have by New Testament writers where they're thinking about believers getting along. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5, if you remember, we, we touched on this uh, in a previous study here that the Apostle Paul was only in Thessalonica for a short period of time, much shorter than he desired to be, and then he had to leave. And so when he reached Athens, eventually it tells us that he sent Timothy back, and he says that up above here in the context, just a few verses. But verse 5, For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith. Now, by faith, he's not saying, did you guys really believe the gospel or not? No. I want to know that you are going on in faith as part of growth. See, you and I not only are saved by faith in the past, but we're being saved, we're growing, we're maturing right now as we live by faith. And so he says, I wanted to find out how your faith is doing for fear that perhaps the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be then in vain. Paul says, I, I, I'm concerned. I, I, I don't want to find out that he has emptied what we taught you. He's not talking here about the gospel for initial salvation. He's talking about what Paul had been teaching them about how to live. And he was concerned that the tempter, being Satan, would have tempted them because of the persecution that arose, and specifically the persecution initially against Paul, that that, that, that Satan would have tempted them so that that work would be in vain. That word vain meaning empties it of, of its content. Therefore, they, they no longer think those things that Paul had taught them. But he goes on and he says in verse 6, But now that Timothy has come to us, he, Timothy was the one that he sent up there. Timothy now comes back to Paul in Athens, and he has come to us from you, and he has brought us good news of your faith and love. And in the Greek, it's the faith and the love. He's talking about something very specific here. He's telling us you guys really are still directing faith at God's promises to you as Christians. This isn't the promise for an unsaved person to be forgiven and declared righteous. This is the promise that God has something for us to do now as believers, promises that God's going to be doing a work in us, and they're directing faith at those promises to serve. And of course, then that service expresses itself specifically in the love. I probably, you might think I overemphasize this, but I don't think I ever emphasize it enough that Christ really left the church chiefly with one command. It's expressed in a variety of ways, so it becomes commands, but he left us really with one command, and that was to love like he loved us. And he says, Timothy said, guess what? They're still believing in God's promises, and they are showing love then. And he says, love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just, just as we also long to see you. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing. 
I think that this is important for us to consider because sometimes when we go through persecutions and difficulties, we're all afraid of how it's affecting us or how it will affect us or what's going to be the end. Am I going to live? Am I going to die? And this was something, I mean, I don't worry about this on a normal day-to-day basis, but it was a very real possibility for these Thessalonians that they might have gotten kicked out of their homes, might have gotten thrown in prison, and who knows, maybe even put to death for well, the charge that they brought against Paul was that he was overturning the world and teaching things contrary to Roman law, comment contrary to the to the religious laws of that land at that time. Of course, they're blowing things out of proportion, but nonetheless, this is what they were trying to charge Paul with. That is, the unbelievers were doing this. And these believers were continuing to love. And that's an encouragement for us. You know, when we're having bad days, when things aren't going well, when we're struggling, when things in the world are going sideways on us, don't stop thinking about and loving your brothers. In fact, sometimes one of the best things for us to do is focus on who we are in Christ and then look at other believers and minister to them as God gives us opportunity and get our eyes off of our own problems, shall we call them. And those problems may be very big, but we should focus on other believers. I'm going to jump down to chapter 4, and Paul says in verse 1, and apparently these are some things that Timothy's brought back, um, brought back some word of this. And so he says, finally then, my brethren, we, we ask of you and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us an instruction Uh, how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you actually do walk. In other words, you you really are doing it, that you should excel or advance even more. For you know what command we gave you by the authority of Jesus Christ. And this word commandments is not the word for, and not the word entele for the new commandment. This is a parangelis. It's It's a charge. We might Related to the idea of a command, but it, it's, I just want you to know it's a distinct word here. So he says, we gave you these charges uh, by this, for this is the will of God. In other words, this is one of the things that God really desires for you, your sanctification, that you practice being set apart to God. We are set apart to God in Christ, but that you practice that. And one specific aspect of that is, it's not the only aspect of sanctification, but one of them is that you abstain from sexual immorality. I think this is always a good thing to point out because sometimes when I was growing up, you'd read those and you're going, well, yeah, that's the way Christians are supposed to be. But you know what? In the culture that that the Thessalonians lived in, it was expected, and I think this is especially important for us to understand, that they didn't expect males, men, to be faithful to their wives. They expected that men fooled around and ran around. That, That was the kind of thing that was kind of expected in their culture. And yet... Christianity comes along and says, "Mm, no, that's not appropriate. It's not appropriate for for us to function that way. We should be considering being either celibate or married. Those are those two things. In fact, he says in verse 4, and and I'm going to give you my particular take on verse 4, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel. In this word, possess, if I click up here on the margin, it's the word acquire, and actually a lot of places where you find this particular word in the New Testament, it does mean to acquire a thing. And therefore, I think when he talks about vessel here, I personally think that he's talking about acquire a spouse. Acquire a spouse, kind of a little bit of a parallel to 1 Corinthians 7. But them in sanctification and in honor. This is important. Get the next part. Not in lustful passion. And that word passion here is, we think, we have a a positive sense of passion today. Oh, they've got passion. But the New Testament word meant suffering, not in cravings of suffering. We're we're not suffering. And so we're going to find, we're going to find a a spouse and marry that person so I don't have to suffer with these these cravings anymore. I can do that. But he says, that's not the reason to marry. You marry in in being set apart in, in an honor. It's a, there's a, a positive thing about this. It's not just about fulfilling or gratifying yourself with this other person. I think that that's an important thing. There are some people that they kind of look at marriage that that's maybe its chief function. And I think that there is definitely more to marriage than just gratifying our 
desires that we have. I'm not saying that that's wrong, uh, but there's definitely a lot more to it and it ought to be treated in honor. And I think that that's a very important thing. But he says the Gentiles do that. In other words, the Gentiles a lot of times marry for that purpose is what Paul was saying. And so he then goes on, he says, and that no man should transgress or go, go beyond what they should and defraud. And that word defraud, I don't know why they translated defraud here because most people go, I don't even know what defraud means. It's the same word that's translated to covet or to be greedy. The, the, the meaning of the word was to want more, to want more with regard to his brother. In other words, he's saying, don't take advantage of one another in this way. Don't be looking at other people as people to fulfill your desires. And so therefore, you're not really looking out for their best. You're selfishly coveting this word defraud here, I would say, coveting your brother. Remember, under the law, it says thou shalt not covet not your neighbor's wife, not your neighbor's slave, not your neighbor's animals. Covet your neighbor's wife? Well, because it's looking at taking advantage of somebody in a way that was inappropriate. I mean, we're talking, just to be frank, we're talking about sex. And he says, you shouldn't be looking at your brothers in Christ this way. This is not the way to, to be handling these people. In this way, because the Lord is avenger of all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. In other words, you need to take this serious. Christianity doesn't come with a set of rules. We are given the command to love one another, but proper love is going to keep you from being selfish and looking at people as objects simply to fulfill your physical cravings. And he says, this is not the way we should be. Verse seven, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity or uncleanness. And that word uncleanness, usually when it's used in this sense, it has the idea of thinking, looking, viewing the world in terms of sex. We ought to be people that we can see a lot more than that. And yet that's one of the things, I, I, I worked in a warehouse when I was in college and I, other times when I've worked with different people that were in those settings and you worked with unbelievers and I was amazed how much they took everything that just seemed to be very innocent and just natural things going on in the, the life and world and they always put a twist, a sexual twist on it. He says, God didn't call us to be that way, to think and to view the world like that but rather again, but in sanctification, being set apart to God. We are set apart to God in Christ, but this is talking about our practice. Verse eight, so he warns him, so he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And the Holy Spirit's the one that marks you out as God's. It is, by the very nature of being the Holy Spirit, is the one that really is, in a practical way, making it possible for you to be set apart. Right now, in practice, so back in chapter 3, he was saying, I was concerned, I was worried about you. Timothy went down and saw you, came back and says, hey, they still are focusing on God's promises, believing, they're having faith, and they're still having love. And he comes over here to, to this chapter and he says, but I got to remind you, and apparently this was a little bit of an issue, which is why Paul would bring it up, that Timothy says, hey, there's, there's a few issues down there. They're doing some good things. Most of them are doing the good thing, but there's a few that need to be reminded that just because the world is carrying on that way doesn't mean we need to carry on that way. There's a better way for us to live, a way that actually shows real love. And then that brings us down to verse 9, where he says, now as regarding love of the brothers. And this is all one word in the Greek. It's Philadelphia. And so it's talking about this fondness, this fond love for brothers. There ought to be a fond love. You ought to look at brothers... Yeah, with, with a fondness to say, they are my brothers. I like being around these people. I want to be around these people. I want to help them. I want to be engaged with them. I, I don't want to just, oh, I'm glad, glad I went home. Glad church is over and I get to go home now and do my own thing. But we ought to be thinking really about how we care for these people. So he says, now is that? He says, you don't have any need for anyone to write you. For you yourselves are, I like this. This is a, a taught by God is a single word in the Greek. You're God taught ones. That's what it is. You are God-taught ones to love one another. And there's that one another, which we've seen many other times, those that are similar it's within the group. You're loving other believers. You're not talking about loving unsaved people here. You're talking about loving one another. Well, it said, love of the brothers. 
For indeed, verse 10, he's coming back to this, for indeed, you do practice this, you are doing this towards the brothers who are in, toward all the brothers who are in all of Macedonia. But we urge you brothers to excel or overflow or even go beyond. Continue to love, excel. You never look at, I'm loving, I'm good. No, I always say, oh, are there more opportunities to love? Am I keeping my eyes open going, well, I do this, I love them by doing this and this. What if God has this or this to do? I share a story. A long time ago, I had a, a, a good friend that was a pastor and a teacher of mine. And he was telling me how there were men that were in seminary and they all were like, well, we have pastor teacher gift. And he says, and when, so when there were certain like work projects and things and he did, and they go, well, I'm not, I have a pastor teacher gift. I don't have that kind of a service gift, so I'm not going to help with that. And he says, but we all can do these things. You can actually love the brothers by maybe helping with some of these other projects. Well, that's not my gift. <laughs> and he was trying to make the point. You don't just serve just in the sphere or realm of your gift. I, I, I've gone to see people that are in the hospital. And I don't have the gift of mercy. I have the gift of pastor teacher. But as a believer, I can still show mercy. I can still serve others in mercy, just like I hope other believers do. I don't have the gift of encouragement. I listen to other people in our church use encouragement to encourage people to put into practice things that I've taught or that others in our church have taught. And I'm like, I, I do encourage people. Don't get me wrong. I do ch do share encouragement and charges to do these things. But man, it's amazing to watch somebody with that gift. But just because I, well, I don't have that gift. I only teach. I don't encourage. No, I can encourage also. So all of that to say is that, yeah, you're serving in love, but continue paying attention because God may open doors for you to serve in other ways beyond just what you're doing right at that moment. And sometimes we can't see beyond the very thing that we're doing right now. So he says in verse 11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet, a calm, peaceful life. It's talking about an inner peace, peace and calm. It's not a word for peace. It's kind of an inner tranquility to life and to tend or practice then to your own business and work with your own hands just as we have commanded you so that you will behave properly towards those that are on the outside and not have a need. And, uh, and I, he's saying, he's going to come up again in the next letter, you need to be taking care of yourself so that the church doesn't have to do it. So those on the outside aren't looking going, yeah, those people are just lazy over there. They just let all those other people at that church take care of them. They're lazy. They're bums. He says, no, you all need to be working with your hands, taking care of and providing for yourselves, not just depending or expecting everybody else to to fit the bill because this thing doesn't, because you can't take care of this. And granted, sometimes believers, even though they're working hard, they still may have a legitimate need, not necessarily a want, but a need. But all of that goes back in the context to having a proper love for one another. I hope this is encouraging to you, for you to stop and think. I covered several things here today, but I think they all fall within this, this, this sphere of what does it look like for us to love? It means we, we really are believing God's promises and we're practicing those with regard to one another. It means that we look at another properly and we don't look at, at one another as that, well, I've got, I have needs and I'm going to go out and, and find those needs out in the world or no, I, I, may, I can't do that, so I'm going to start looking at the body of Christ just to get those needs fulfilled. And I'm talking about the sexual needs back up in the context again. Or to come down into this passage and it's like, well, I can serve like this, but I, I don't serve like that. No. There's no realm of service that God's put, put before us as believers that is not appropriate for you to do. If God puts an opportunity for you to serve, you must do it. And all those are expressions of love. My wife, I'm just as an example of this, my wife cooks food for other people at times, cooks food for our whole church to share. Uh, and yet her spiritual gift is not the spiritual gift of giving or the spiritual gift of service. I used to think my wife largely had the gift of encouragement, but she actually does a really good job teaching the Bible. It could be both of those. But she doesn't say, well, this is all I do at church. I'm telling you, I've watched my wife do many things, take many opportunities to step up and serve and help other people. And it's just a reminder, again, 
that this is all of these fit within this realm of love. And if we would focus on trying to serve and help other believers rather than what can they do for me, looking at, well, how can God use me in their life? And maybe it's not always, like I said, maybe it's not always immediately what you think. It'd be easy for me as a pastor to think all I do is teach, but I can guarantee you I've had lots of opportunities to do things other than just teach and serving other believers. And I've watched a lot of believers in our church and in other churches do the same. And I think most of us know this. We just sometimes need to be reminded that it's always appropriate for us to continue to love one another. And it'll help us get along. With that, I encourage you have a good day up there in the Lord. And as always, I thank you for joining me.